Hey guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It is nine o'clock on a Monday and it's time for a five by five, not just any normal five by five, but a festive five by five. First of all, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. I hope you've had a fantastic Christmas. Now, one of the most popular videos on the five by fives are the live performance specials. So this is a live performance Christmas special. And the reason it's a Christmas special is because this was filmed at one of my Christmas gigs. This is a corporate close-up job. Um, there were about 150 people in the room. It was a sales thing. So it was a lot of uh, alpha males. Everybody's up for a laugh. There was a lot of effing and blinding. There was a lot of military-based style humor. So I think that's reflected in the performances that you're gonna see. And what I'm doing on this video is uh, you're gonna see six segments. So you're gonna see three live performances uh, to big tables at this gig. And then after each live performance, I'm gonna run the footage again, but I'm gonna do a commentary track over the top talking about what I did, why I did it, and, and, and what the reasons behind making the choices I did during the performance. So hopefully that'll help. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one thing that uh, you'll notice is I've done three tricks that I've had a lot of people ask me to do on a live performance special in this type of environment, which is uh, card in the box, key master, and um, a routine with the Rubik's Cube. All of which people wanted to see. I've had lots of emails and I've had lots of comments on YouTube saying, hey, could you do this routine? in a big table environment so we can see how it will play on a big table. So that's what you're gonna see here. Three tricks, uh, three live performances, and then uh, commentary tracks over the top. And this was literally shot at a gig a couple of days ago. So without further ado, let's have a look at it. This is the full live performances. I'm the magician and you look so excited about this. Yes. Would you like to see a trick? Yes. Amazing. This is Matt, he's filming. He's sending it over to you guys so you've got this for posterity. Uh, can, I, can I get around everybody? So can I show you two more tricks? Would that be okay? Yes. Does anybody here watch Britain and Top Town? Did anybody watch the latest season with the little kid with the Rubik's Cube who got through to the final? So his name is Ryland and he's my son. I know, he's amazing. He did, he did great. He's got his own gig tonight, but he's one of the best rooms to be in the dishes in the world. And whenever people find out Ryan is my son, they always ask him to do a trick with a Rubik's Cube. I'm going to show you something in the using a Rubik's Cube. Now, as well as this Rubik's Cube, I also have in my pocket my key. I'm going to put my key just here. And I want everybody to remember that I put my keys down there before I did anything. Now, will you help me? What's your name? Right. Guys, so six sides to a Rubik's Cube. And it's a different colour on each side. The more you mix these up, the harder they are to solve. 47 quintillion million combinations. Anytime you want to, just say stop. There. Hold your hand out for me. This is one combination of 47 quintillion million. In other words, just to put that into context, by the way, I'm loving your body language, so you're not going to get me magic <laughs> To put that into context, if we took 47 quintillion million Rubik's Cubes and laid them across the UK, it would cover every square inch and go 47 stories high. What you're about to see is impossible. I put some keys down. And on these keys, there is, hopefully you can see that, a keychain with a Rubik's Cube. What's really interesting is you said stop anywhere, and sign number one matches exactly. Don't feel like you need to clap. <laughs> As I show you each side, it'll become more impressive. Side number two matches exactly. Side number three matches exactly. Side number four matches exactly. The bottom is side number six. Thank you very, very much. That's not bad, right? But here's the thing whenever I do this, people say, Craig, because that's my name. They say, Craig, can you solve the Rubik's Cube? I'm going to try and do that. World Champion solves it in five seconds. I'm going to solve it in one second, sir. If I'm not looking you directly in the eyes, I'm not being rude, the light's bouncing off your head. So I'm going to do this. <laughs> you, me, and him have got a three way laser beam thing going on. Right. <laughs> Here we go. 
You're going to say go. When you say go, one second later, this thing is going to solve. The deal is, if I can solve this in one second, you guys are going to go crazy. Right? When you say go, watch the cue, focus right here. When you say go, go. That's a second, right? Oh, wow. Now, the only, you don't have to solve the cue. The only way that we can make this better is if somebody it gets better. <laughs> The only way that we can make this better is if somebody else solved the cube that didn't know how to solve a Rubik's cube, somebody like you. When you stand up, they're going to give you a big round of applause. Stand up. Now put your bag on the test. Just for a second, stand behind me. In a second, we're going to solve the cube behind your back. I wouldn't. You, do you see it? When this goes behind your back, I just want you to turn it like that. Can you do that for me? Do you see what I'm doing? That's all I want you to do. Take one step forward. I'm already mixed up. We can only make it work. So, keep your hands behind your back. I'm going to put it into your hand. You can feel it now. You feel it. Start to turn it like I said. And keep turning it. Any time you want to stop, stop. And keep it behind your back and say I've stopped. Now in a second, when I say go, you're going to bring this out and you're going to show it. That cue can be in any one of a million combinations. If somehow you can get some of the cue behind your back, they're going to go crazy. Not for me, but for you. Three, two, one, go. Okay, so this is the opening routine on this particular table. And one thing that I find uh, when you're performing to a table, and first of all, look at where I'm standing. There was one on this particular table, uh, there was somebody who hadn't actually attended or they they weren't there at the table or something. So that's where I'm going to stand. Oh, there they are. They're sitting down at this point. Um, what I try to do is I try to find myself a gap. When I perform at this sort of environment, I'm performing to the whole table at once. What I don't like, and I've talked about this on the channel before, is talking to like one or two people that are next to me and 80% of the table are just switched off. I try to address everybody. And part of that is getting in so that everybody can see you. Now, cube magic, I find, is a very good opening routine on a table. And you've probably seen uh, videos of me in the past where I bring a bag out and I do a full routine. Uh, in this case, I was just doing a very simple one cube routine. So I wasn't using multiple cubes. I wasn't doing a clear cube finale. It was literally one cube. Now notice at the beginning, I put my um, uh, keys down. Those keys have on it a cube, and that's a cube I got from uh, Kev Gregson and Colin Klaus. And it's a perfect way to actually do a cube matchup without any gimmicks at all. I'm doing my timing force here. Uh, which is uh, my way of actually forcing a particular pattern on a cube. I'm doing the timing force. Now notice, when I put the big cube down, I'm bringing that person's hand up. I'm not putting it down on the table. I'm asking somebody to hold their hand out. I'm bringing the hand up, and I'm putting the cube on their hand. It's really important that everybody can see what's going on the whole time. Also notice I'm bantering with everybody else on the table as well. I'm trying to make comments about each individual person and, and, and getting people's interest and engagement the whole way through. So now I get to the point where I'm, I'm going into the first phase of this particular routine, which is the matchup. And you, you're basically showing that the big cube is predicted by using the keychain. Now you can use lines like, hey, have you seen that before? Or, you know, the, the first time I saw this, I forgot to applaud as well. Uh, you know, people, some people don't like those lines. I do, because what it allows me to do is get the applause that I want. Uh, sometimes in environments like this, it's, it's, it's not easy for people to applaud, especially over here in the UK. It's not something they're accustomed to. So it's almost like educating them. Uh, now, I do believe that when you do any multi-phase routine, each phase has to build, which is why I always follow a matchup with solving the cube. Uh, and the reason is I don't do it the other way around because I think that the solve of a cube is a lot more visually impressive than matching a cube. So you do the cube matchup first of all. Now notice that uh, the keychain has got a key master on it. And the reason is 
um, later on on this particular set I'm going to go into key master and it allows me to bring the key, uh, the keys out in a very natural way but we're doing this uh, we're doing this uh, this solve right now notice I grab everybody's attention and I get everybody to focus on the cube and that's when I do the solve now I have routines where I do multiple solves and multiple solves and I throw them up in the air and do it behind my back and that's all well and good and that's absolutely fantastic but um, I do like to keep it very, very simple when I'm doing, when I've just got one cube on me. So after I've done the cube solve, I'm going to go straight into the finale. And the finale is to do the solution by Michael Murray. Now, this is normally just a stage routine, and it's a routine that's done on stage. However, I do like to do it on big tables as long as the table is in the correct position. Because what I want to do is I want to actually have a spectator stand up and stand behind me and demonstrate to them what I want them to do and then put it behind their back. Now, the interesting thing is, um, if you're performing on a side table where there's a, uh, a wall behind you, nobody's really gonna see anything at all. And yes, the table behind me might see and might look over and see um, that the cube is already solved, but that's actually a magic trick for them. It's almost like a dual reality thing. First of all, they're not really paying attention, but even if they were, they saw a mixed up cube and I put it in their hand and immediately it solved. It's a completely different trick to what the rest of the table is experiencing in front of the spectator, but it's still a valid trick. But to be honest, nine times out of 10, nobody's gonna really pay any attention at all. So, I mean, the thing to learn from this is don't be afraid to take a stage trick and bring it into the close up environment if you think it's going to be appropriate for that environment. And as long as you manage your audience and as long as you manage your angles, and as long as you manage where everybody is, it's generally not an issue. As you can see in this situation, it totally wasn't an issue at all. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's some people love cube magic. Some people hate cube magic. It's totally up to you. But I find that it's an item that everybody is used to. People know how difficult it is to solve a cube. And when they see you solving it in one second flat, it's normally a very impressive feat that they really enjoy. Um, so there you go. That's how to actually take a cube routine with just one cube and a keychain and make it work on a big table. Right, we're gonna do a trick of the pack of cards. Are you old enough to drink? No, just stop. Are you gonna? You can. We can do a trick. Do me a favour, my friend. You're gonna grab a card, but take the number card, not the picture card. Any card with number on. When you get a card, do me a favour, show your friends. But apparently I'm not your friend, that's what we're bonding over this amazing experience. Can I borrow that off you? What I'm going to do is take this pen, write your name on the face of the card, not on the back of the face. Not on your face, on the face of the card. Big letters, write your name, then underneath you can put your bank account number and sword card, that would be amazing. I'll take the pen back, that's how I've got it. We'll put it back, watch this. Now you see, every time I take a pen and squeeze, it looks like it disappears. It goes behind your ring. I can take a pen, I can take it, make it disappear, make it go back over the end. It's very simple. If I put the top on the pen, the top disappears, it doesn't go far, it goes on the end like that. I take the top back on the pen, the pen disappears. I take the pen top, the pen top disappears. The pen top goes behind your ear. The pen goes behind my ear. No. One person. That's good. That's good. Job. Right, you're going to put the card back in the deck. Anytime you want to, just say stop. Put the card back there. So, guys, this is the best trick you'll see, I guarantee it. Somewhere in here is your card. I'm going to show you all the difference between slight of hand and real magic. Okay, so first of all, slight of hand. I'm going to take one card. This card right here, the King of Clubs, is that your card? One down, 51 to go. One more trick. Watch the King. Most magicians do this face down. I'm going to do it face up. Watch. I'm going to take that King, wave it over the card box. When I do, just like this, hopefully, if I get the right spot, that King will turn right there into the six. I love how you guys are just talking to each other. It's like the commentators in WWE. It's, a, it's like, it's like you watch the left hand, I watch the right hand. That's it. And we're still mesmerized. We'll tag team and we'll get in together. No, that's sleight of hand. That's not, later on we'll sit down and form a focus group, okay? Now that's not real magic. Real magic looks like this. Take half the cards, spread them out like a magician. 
amazing. I'm gonna no, you need to do it right. I'm gonna put the six there, give them one shuffle, and then when you've done that, put them on the packet on the table. On there. Now you tell me, sir. That's fair, right? Because he's shuffling. What? Real magic. One, two, three. See, when I do that, what happens is one card flies up in the air invisibly. It does six somersaults, I counted. And even though the box has been on the table the whole time, look, there's one card underneath the box and one card only. Turn it over. That's the like, yeah, I know. I don't know you very well, sir, but I'm guessing that's your... I don't know you very well, but I'm guessing that's your pissed off face. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Keep it in, I've got a week finish. Now look, I can't tell you how that works, but this is how it doesn't work. This is what most people think I do. They think I take your sign card, put it on the table, and then when you lot aren't looking, I put the box on top. Be honest, is that what you do what I did? Logically, it's the only thing I could do, but I don't do that. It goes here, I do this, this, up in the air, so when you get the idea, it's under the box, then turn it over, have a look. <laughs> Do you see the signature, yeah? Watch the signature. It's too close, I tell you. It goes halfway down. Liam, say go. Did you see it go? Not the card, the whole pack was under the box. That's every single card in the deck right there under the box. I know. I know. You look like you're about to have a heart attack at this point. Look. One last time. Nothing under the box. Liam, put your finger gently on top. I'm going to put the card down in the middle. It's still going to go under the box. Now, if you think I've cheated, you're going to have a tiny peek underneath. I'm a little bit offended by that, mate, but whatever. Watch. One, two, three. If I told you it was under there now, would that be good? Have a look. Yeah, that would have been good. I'm not that good. Although you were reacting as if it was. Look, here's the thing. I went further. Because now... There's one card inside the box. Thank you, it might not be the card. That's why they're not coming in. Turn it on your show on me. Just for you. Do you want me to do it in one, two, and three seconds? How many seconds? Half a second. You got it, what? The one in the box. Half a second, I'll go further for you. I'll do that, I'll make every single card in the deck round its lost. And the reason is over here in the box, that's every single card in the pack. Any questions? How? How? Magic. Sorry? I am in the magic circle. In fact, that is my magic circle membership card right now. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually official. I'm not just in the magic circle. I'm in the... Yeah, I am. <laughs> Look at me. No hair, tattoos. <laughs> Look at me, love. If I can do that trick, don't you think I would have done it already? No. But here's the thing. Do you remember I showed you my magic circle membership card? Watch this. Do me a favor. Liam, snap your fingers. Now snap your fingers up there. Nothing in my hands. Watch this. You're not going to believe this. Remember the magic circle membership card? Now on top, yeah. Shit just got real, Liam. Because now look at what's on top of there. Oh, you can put that up in the bedroom wall and put it up next to your One Direction poster. There you go, that's me. Thank you so right, so what you're about to see now is a performance of my card in the box routine, uh, which is uh, based on James Brown's card in the box, and you can learn it off my Penguin Live. I've had a few people ask me to show a live performance video of me doing card in the box at sort of a big corporate table. Uh, I've done lots of videos of it done in restaurants and walk around situations and smaller groups. Um, but ha I've had a few people say to me, is this the type of routine that works on a big table because you're having to put the props down on the table? And the answer is yes, as long as you're aware of where everybody is and the angles and so on and so forth. Now, notice right from the very beginning when I first approached the group that I like to have fun with my audience. For me, 
It's about connecting with the audience when I walk over to the table before even doing any magic. The other thing is if I see somebody on the table that I think I could um, pick on <laughs> and would be appropriate for uh, being the volunteer in the show, then I'll have them move around if, if, if that makes sense. Now, the person that I'm using in this particular trick, um, d d first of all, a little bit of context. This was at a sales event, and it was a very hardcore sales event for a recruitment company. So everybody, there was a lot of effing and blinding, and there was a lot of, um, it was almost like a military base, if that kind of makes sense. So the reason I, I got the guy involved in it that I did is because he looked a lot younger than everybody else there, so I knew I could kind of have some fun with that. Um, which is more important to me than the actual trick itself. It's so important to me that I'm able, first and foremost, to entertain the audience. Because not everybody loves magic. That's just a fact. Not everybody loves magic. But everybody loves to be entertained. And a lot of people like comedy. And, you know, I want to try and do something that everybody is going to be involved in. And uh, picking the right spectator is very, very important. So, if you know the card in the box routine... The key thing that you're going to learn from this performance is misdirection. The importance of misdirection and the importance of misdirecting people and filling every single moment with magic. I mean, that's really important. I mean, you see here, I'm messing around with a Sharpie marker. I'm doing multiple vanishes. I'm having it vanish. I'm having it appear um, behind my ear and that sort of stuff. I mean, what we're doing here is just filling every single moment with magic. And I, I think that's very important. Yes, you could have somebody just sign a card and they could just sign a card and that's all well and good. But if you can get them to sign a card and you can put some magic in there as well as the signing the card, then that's even better. So the card is returned and shuffled into the deck. And notice I grab their attention. Notice that I'm performing to the whole table. I'm not performing to just the person who's helping me. Yes, I'm focusing on that person, but I'm turning and I'm looking at the whole table the whole time. And I see a lot of people, and when they perform, they focus it on just that one spectator. And so everybody else feels disengaged, and they, they, they basically ultimately lose interest. What you want to do is you want to have it set up so that everybody is involved in the trick. That's really, really important. And it's also about focusing on the correct moment. It's about getting the people that are watching to focus on what you're doing. And that's, again, really important because it, take that color change, for example, which is the first phase of this routine where I take an indifferent card and I turn it into the selection. You saw the reaction to that. People absolutely love it. And that's because the twirl change, uh, the shake change, whatever you want to call it, is a fantastic move. But if people weren't looking and they turned away for that split second, they're going to miss everything. And if they do miss everything, it means that, um, it means that the, the moment has been lost on half the audience. So focusing people's attention is very important. Now, a lot of people say to me, when you're doing card under box, how do you have the balls to put the card under the box openly in front of the audience? And the answer is it's direction of attention. So notice, they look at the card under the box, and as they, as they look at the card under the box, that's where the attention is focused. Now, in a second, you're going to see me drop that signed card down on the table and give a pseudo-explanation. By the way, you see the guy shaking my hand? He thinks the trick's over. He's just spontaneously shaking my hand, which is really nice, but I want to keep things on track. Um, so a little joke, hey, keep focusing, I've got a weak finish, gets everybody back, back on track. That can happen in live performances an awful lot. So watch this mis misdirection over and over again. You see that the box is loaded right in front of the spectator. Now, once the box is loaded, I bring the deck up in front of my face and I focus attention up there. Then the attention comes to the box. They look at the card. While they're looking at the card, I'm doing the next, uh, I'm doing the next load. And that's really the basics of this routine. It sounds ridiculous, but you're putting the cards or the card or the deck underneath the box when people aren't looking. That's all you're doing. Now, also notice it's very important to be observational when you're doing any type of magic, but especially on a big table. What I mean by observational is you'll see 
over and over again. I'll comment on something someone's done. Hey, you look like a rabbit caught in headlights. Oh, I love your look. I don't know you very well, but I'm guessing that you're pissed off face. All these lines um, that some magicians consider hack lines, these are designed to bring different people into the performance as you're doing it, which is vitally important. <coughs> now, the finale for me is the most important thing because this is the thing that a lot of people struggle with, how to load the deck into the box. Now, obviously, I talk about this on my Penguin Live in great detail, but notice they I'm acting like the trick's over. I focus attention on the card. I get them to take it out. I get them to turn it over. Nobody has noticed that right in front of them, I put a deck in a box. Nobody ever notices that. And the reason nobody ever notices that is because understanding the on-beat and the off-beat. And, and to be clear, and I've talked about this before on the channel, the offbeat is when people are relaxed. They think the trick's over, so they're not really watching as closely. You want all of the moves to happen on the offbeat. Very, very, very important. And again, every move. So you notice when the deck goes into the box, that's when I do the top change. That's when I load the card. Well, actually, I don't. Um, I'm using an Orphic Plus as my card to wallet, which is my card to wallet of choice, to be perfectly honest. And I always take it out and show my Magic Circle membership card first. And the reason I show my Magic Circle membership card is because I can then take it out a little bit later on, and I can then show that the card is right there next to the Magic Circle membership card. Now, one thing I like so much about the Orphic wallet is that it looks like a normal wallet. Um, which is really important. So I've told them what's going to happen. I've told them that the card's going to appear right there in the wallet. I've loaded it right in front of their face, but they don't see a thing. They don't even realize. And then you open up the wallet and you show them, and how can you get a bigger finish than that? I mean, that is a really strong finish, and you can take that out and you can give it to the spectator as a souvenir. So what have we learned from this whole thing? The first thing that we've learned is the importance of the on-beat and the off-beat and the importance of knowing when to focus on um, when to when to focus the audience's attention and not to focus the audience's attention we've talked about how to actually pick the correct type of spectator for a trick and don't be afraid to get that spectator to move around if it means that uh, the trick's going to be better either from a presentational point of view or from the point of view of um, um, a technical side of things and and also we've talked about really trying to make every moment count so there you go. There's a lot to unpack there, but that is the card to wallet uh, and the card to card in the box done in a live performance situation at a corporate event. Hope that helps. Right, here we go. Um, I got keys. This is called the two key trick. Mainly because it uses two keys. What's your name? Louise, can you hold your hand out for me, Louise? This is key number one. Louise, hold this key. We'll get back to you in a bit. Turn your hand on. Now, I also have this key. This is key number two. You have a look at this one. Make sure it's oh, okay. Right. Check it out. Is it good? Real key? Yeah. Gracias. Yeah, yeah. Have a look at it. Take your time, man. Get paid by the hour. Are we good? So, I want to all watch the key very carefully. The food's coming, but can I finish this trick? Is that alright? What? Let's just get the food down. I'm going to use my psychic mind powers and guess everyone's got a Christmas dinner. There we go. Uh, are you ready? Yeah. Right, watch. You examine the key. Check this out. Watch the key. More importantly, the hole. If I do this, one, two, three, I can pull the hole off the key. Now that hole was hanging on the key chain. It can't go, but watch this. If I do this and this, the hole has to go somewhere. Turn your hand over and show them what's in your hand. Now you've got two holes on one key. I love your face. Now here's the thing. For the big finish, I'm going to put the hole back on this key. Now to be clear, you're everyone's eyes and ears. This is my big finale. As I walk off, they're going to go crazy if, I, if you can sell this for me. There's no holes on the key, is there? Hold your hand out. Squeeze tightly. Turn your hand over. 
You see two holes, don't you? What's your name? Yeah. Leah, can you do me a favor? Can you grab my shaft? That sounds good. Can I grab your shaft? <laughs> oh, I fly out the The stem and the key. I've been there. No snails, man. Watch this. One, two, three. All I have to do is pop, and I can take that hole right off the coast. That's going to go somewhere. And, and this is the bit where I want you guys to go crazy because I'm not just going to put the hole back on the green. I'm going to go one step further. I'm going to try and take the hole and put it on the stem of the key right to the very bottom. And when I snap my fingers, you're going to turn your hand over. You're wait a minute. You're going to turn your hand over. When I snap my fingers, you're going to open up your hand. You're going to show them if that hole's right down that shaft, they're going to go mad as I walk away from the table. Three, two, one. Turn it over. Look at that. You ever seen a hole right there on the stem of the oh. key? Oh. Oh. <laughs> it doesn't work like that, I'm trying. <laughs> so in this live performance, you're going to see a performance of Keymaster. And again, one of the reasons that, and it's just the classic Keymaster routine. And one of the reasons why I'm doing a performance of the classic Keymaster routine is the same as the card in the box. You'll notice um that i'm doing this to a big table this is the routine that i immediately followed card in the box with and a lot of people have asked me if Keymaster will play to a big group of people on a big table and the answer is yes but again you have to make sure that everybody can see what's going on so notice i have people examine the second key and i i get them to show it around and that's very very important you want everybody to know that apparently what you're doing is 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 just using a normal key now i mentioned when i talked about card in the box that one of the most important things is focusing people's attention it's even more important with this now what you're seeing here is something that can happen an awful lot at any type of event especially a corporate event waiters putting the food down now you don't want to be a diva because they have a job to do, and the venue or the entertainer, the event planner won't be happy if if you stop service. So if service, if the food comes down, you have to kind of stop, and you have to kind of take a step back because you want the food put down. But you want to keep the attention of everybody. It's a tricky thing to do, but you want to keep the attention of everybody. And the reason you want to keep the attention of everybody is because obviously you don't want to lose their attention. And I do tend to ask, is it okay if I finish this trick? I don't want to just have their food go cold. So notice, as soon as the food goes down, I focus their attention back on the trick. And did you notice that when she opened up her hand and she, she saw the key, she reacted, which caused the audience to react. But then I have her show the key to everybody else on the table. Now notice that she's holding her hand tight and also notice that I'm focusing my attention elsewhere. Okay, now this takes a bit of audience management because obviously she could open her hand, but I've done this enough to know that she's not going to. And notice there's some jokes in there. And again, the jokes that you do are very much based on the audience you're performing for. I got to know this audience well enough to know that the lady that I'd actually done that to saying, hey, you can hold my shaft is something that this group would find funny. You need to be able to read your audience, read the room basically. So, you, this is the big finale. What you're about to see right now is the big finale. The, 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 the hole's going to go back. And I want to get this done as quickly as possible because I want them to eat their food. So, again, I have, them, uh, I have the, the moment where the hole goes on the key. I have her show everyone. She reacts. Everybody claps. And then I can take a step back and I can have them eat, um, which, again, is very, very important. When the food goes down... If you're in the middle of a 15-phase routine that's going to take 15 minutes to perform, take a step back, break it down, to basically jump to the big finale. Now, in the case of Keymaster, that's not a problem because obviously it's a, it's a quick trick. So I can go straight to the finale and it's not too much of an issue. If I was in the middle of an ambitious card and I just started, 
I would probably go straight into the card to wallet or the card to box or whatever the finale of that routine is. And that's really important because what you need to do is you need to get out of there as soon as possible. Now, I'm not saying that you need to get out in the middle of a trick, although that has happened, which is why it's important to perform magic that has multiple phases so that you're not waiting 10 minutes for one magical payoff that you can't deliver. But um you know generally as a rule you want to go straight to the finale so there you go that is a performance of key master to a big group of people on a big table um hopefully that helps everybody that's asked me to talk about that so there you go guys that's another five by five in the bag hope you enjoyed the live performances let me know what you think in the comments down below now you want to see more videos like this like the video subscribe to the channel leave a comment down below i'm going to be back again tomorrow on uh with another video the videos are continuing every single day over christmas so i'm going to be back again tomorrow with another video i think a matchamentary episode is dropping tomorrow so look out for that and uh thanks once again for supporting the channel over to 2022. I really appreciate it. If you haven't already done so, go check out The Netrix. It's www.thenetrix.com. You can get access to um, absolutely everything. There's so much content on The Netrix. It's ridiculous. You want to learn the cube routine? It's on The Netrix. You want to learn the card routine? Uh, it's on my Penguin Live and Key Masters available from Penguin Magic as well. I'll see you again soon. Thanks very much for watching. My name's Craig from Magic TV. Mm.